So welcome back, everybody. Welcome back after our coffee break. And also welcome to everybody joining us remotely from around the world. Welcome to New Space Europe 2023. So how's the energy here in the room after coffee? Did you enjoy it? Yeah? You ready for the next session? That does not seem like it. Let me try that one more time. Is everybody ready for our sustainability session? Ah, it just feels so much better. All right. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Session sustainability now. And you are in for a real treat. Let me tell you that. Our next guest is a chief scientist. He is the chief scientist. Uh, he leads the technical vision for Privateer, a space company which he also co-founded with the aim to create the data infrastructure that will enable sustainable growth for the new space economy. He is also a renowned space environmentalist, a and astrodynamicist specializing in space object detection, tracking, identification, and characterization, as well as spacecraft navigation. But that's not enough. He's also an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. And he also co-founded Moriba Jaw Universal LLC in order to co-create media, art, and entertainment across a variety of platforms aimed at taking space environmentalism mainstream to spread awareness about space debris, uh, space debris, the ever-growing threat to humanity that most people aren't even aware of and don't even know exists. He says, I quote, I seek to show humanity a path for itself through the lens of space environmentalism and sustainability. Let's give him a big round of applause and make him feel welcome. Here is Dr. Mariba Ja. <laughs> welcome. Great to have you. All right, my brother. Welcome. Thank you so much. Please. Right. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Woohoo! What? <laughs> yes! Space sustainability and environmentalism. All right. So I want to say a few things. Um, first of all, this is my first time to Luxembourg, so I very much um, enjoy the cold weather. Uh, thank you so much for that. And, you know, within the next, I guess, 24 minutes and 52, 51, I'm, j I'm joking, I won't do that. Uh, within the next 24 minutes, we're going to be talking about some very heartfelt and meaningful things. And I very much wish to ask that each and every one of you be present, us here together, uh, as much as possible because what I have to say is very important and I'm trying to engage each and every one of you. I also want to say that before we begin, I want to, as a celestial steward, as a steward of Gaia, Mother Earth, I'd like to invoke the stewards, original stewards of these lands where we're currently at right now and I want to ask permissions of the original stewards of these lands for us to receive guidance, wisdom, here and now, from the north, the west, the south, the east, above Father Sky, below Mother Earth, and within. And I want to say that I acknowledge the spark of life within each and every one of you. Namaste. Let us begin. We, as a humanity, have been making decisions that collectively are leading to our self-extinction. And there's no reason for that. It doesn't have to be that way. I can tell that most people tend to believe that we're independent of each other. And that independence shows up 
when I hear the words, that's not my problem. And I hear that's not my problem quite a bit, unfortunately. So the things that are happening on one side of the planet supposedly don't affect the others. And I'm letting you know that we have forgotten about the interconnectedness amongst all things. But Mother Earth is giving us feedback on the unintended consequences of our actions. Every day and every year, we're getting more and more of this feedback. And we are participating in what should be called an ecocide. We are destroying and killing our ecosystems. Now, while many of us can look around and see this devastation and how this is getting worse and worse every year, what I'm gonna do here for the next few minutes is we're going to zoom out and go above the atmosphere to the next ecosystem that we've been disregarding called near-Earth orbital space. This is where we're headed. We already have a junkyard on orbit. And I'm gonna show you here very shortly about this junkyard. We're tracking about 50,000 objects ranging in size from cell phones to the space station in different orbits. And about 5,000 work and everything else is garbage. But who cares? Why should you care? Well, these robots in the sky called satellites, well, these things provide services and capabilities that we are dependent and reliant upon every day. From position, navigation, timing, communication, the way that we engage with each other, the way that we connect with each other across the globe, financial transactions, uh, the ability to monitor the Earth. And I have to tell you, we as a humanity know more about the planet and ourselves because of these robots in the sky called satellites than by any other source of information. But the story doesn't end there. Many of these things that we launch return. None of these photos are AI generated. You can Google them yourselves. Coming to a home theater near you or a school or a church are gonna be school bus sized objects dropping out of the skies because we still don't have good regulation around that either. Yeah, most of the planet is covered by water, so statistically, most of these things enter the ocean. But people say, oh, the oceans are big, so who cares? These things are gonna start landing in populated areas. That's just statistics, folks. Eventually, that's going to happen. What else are we sacrificing? Well. We're sacrificing our dark and quiet skies as well. But there are a group of people across the globe, pockets of them, that have always embraced interconnectedness amongst all things, that have always embraced an intergenerational contract of stewardship with the planet. They haven't abandoned that. These are our indigenous people, and they have a voice, and they have something to tell us. These are the original scientists and engineers. They have created extensive knowledge systems and they solve problems. They don't have three letters behind their names and you won't see them populating the classrooms in your top universities here in Luxembourg or elsewhere. But these are the people that are keepers of ancient wisdom, traditional ecological knowledge. Imagine if we could fuse this traditional ecological knowledge with Western science to make that scale, to help ourselves. Imagine if we could start considering ourselves as stewards of the planet versus owners of stuff, where ownership asks us to claim rights to things, but stewardship asks us to claim responsibility over stuff. I got involved in all this because I was exposed to a dark sky in Montana, guarding nuclear missiles when I was younger. 
and I'd see dots of light going across the missile silos, and I didn't know what those things were. Come to find out, there were human-made objects reflecting sunlight, and that got me curious. So I decided to get a PhD in it. That was supposed to be a joke. Okay, I'm just trying to see if you guys are awake and staying with me here. But here's the thing. Um, all of our history has happened on this blue dot, okay? Everything that we know about ourselves, everything has happened here, and we're losing it. We're losing it to our own effects and, again, our collective behaviors. All right, so with that, I think I'm going to switch and go to this iPad. Let's see, what do I have here? Uh, okay, let me just bring this up because I'm sure this is all going to work. Yeah, so let's see. Technology, you got to love this stuff. All right, here we go. So I'm actually trying to switch these things, and for whatever reason, it's not switching. So I don't know what's going on. So this is, this is where I invoke technical help with this sort of thing, with tablets, because this thing is stuck. So. Anybody know some good songs that we can sing here? Well, uh, look, these things happen to folks. I mean, uh, all right, so here we go. So. Just a second. Yep. Yep. My goodness. Thank you. A round of applause, please. <laughs> All right, so there's this thing that I invented uh, called Astrograph, and now it's called Wayfinder with uh, this company, Privateer. And every single dot, so this is you know live. This, the reason why there was this difficulty is because this isn't something that's just Prepackaged. I'm showing you this stuff live. So here's this website, and every single dot is a human-made object currently orbiting the Earth. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to zoom out, and I'm actually going to, you're not seeing everything, so I'm going to zoom out, and I'm going to show you a little bit more. Here we go. What do you think? Does that look good to you? Is that a good story? Um, the blue dots are things that work, and everything else is garbage. Now, the dots are not to size uh, you know, for the object, but it's showing you where these objects are. And everything's moving, so I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to show you. So out of the 5,000 things that are working, um, over half of those belong to Elon Musk. They're all Starlink satellites. And during a busy year, we used to launch like one satellite per month, and now we're averaging about 12 per week. So while, while you're kind of asleep, while we're here, every three weeks there's at least 60 satellites going up that are mostly Starlinks and all these different orbits. And again, the blue things are working, everything is, is garbage. I'm going to show you some other stuff. So 
So here's a piece of junk. Let's see, uh, this company KMI puts it at $9 million to remove, okay? If you wanna clean that up, it's gonna cost about $9 million. And you can go to the website and it'll show you like the basis for the price, but there's a $9 million piece of junk. Let's see. All right, here's another piece of debris, $7 million to remove that. All right, here's another one, $9 million. I think you're starting to get the point. Like all this stuff is in the millions and this is just the stuff that we're tracking, which again, size of a cell phone uh, and larger, okay? So we have a problem, uh, if you haven't been able to tell yet. Let's, let's keep on looking a little bit more. This right here is called the conjunction streaming service that we put together at University of Texas at Austin is gonna take a little bit of time here to populate, but what you're gonna see here is out of things in low Earth orbit, out of about 20,000 objects, over the next 20 minutes, which ones do we predict are gonna come within 10 kilometers of each other? And if so, show me. So that's what the traffic patterns are looking like. Green dots are pairs of objects where both are working. Yellow dots are where one is working and the other one is dead. And red dots are both dead and our strategy is hope that they don't collide with each other. Now, these crisscrossings or conjunctions don't mean that these things are colliding. It just shows you that these things are coming within 10 kilometers of each other. But what I'm telling you is that this pattern is only getting worse and worse every day. In this histogram, you see that the relative speed has a spike at 15 kilometers per second. That's 15 times the speed of a bullet. If, we're tr if the smallest thing that we're tracking is a cell phone, which is much larger than a bullet, and the relative speed is 15 times that of a bullet, you can imagine that when that cell phone traveling at 15 times the speed of a bullet hits anything, it's gonna be a bad day for whatever it encounters. Clearly, if it's, uh, if it's human, human or crude, uh, craft, it's, it's done, right? If it's a satellite, it becomes obliterated. If it's a rocket body, it becomes tens of thousands of pieces. In fact, going back to Wayfind, I'm going to show you this. Can everybody see that kind of pink ellipse right there? So that pink ellipse came from one object. I call these super spreader events, just like with COVID. So one object exploded or something collided with it and it became all those pink dots. One object created that. We've had three of those happen in the past five years and rocket bodies that are still on orbit from the 60s are about 2,000. There's about 2,000 of those. So basically three out of the 2,000 have already kind of like been converted on all these dots. That means that we have what, 1,997 if my you know, two grade math doesn't fail me uh, you know, horribly. So these things are ticking time bombs. And out of those objects, probably about hmm, seven to 900 uh, come from Russia, about 500 of, or, or so of those come from uh, the United States and the rest from China. Those are the three countries that pretty much are responsible for most of the junk in space, okay? That's just fact. So what else is going on here? Well, I'm gonna show you another thing that we contend with and it's this light pollution. So I'm gonna show you this brief movie and this is what astronomers have to deal with every night. What you're gonna see is you're gonna see some streaks. The streaks are basically kind of what a telescope would see where reflected light is, is, is falling onto the, the sensors that the telescope has. And the, the thing that you see on the right, um, you know, all those things are called Messier objects. It's places where astronomers care to look at things. The globe that you see on the upper left is if you were at the telescope looking straight up and then you know northwest, south, east kind of thing, the directions. And then you have two Mulvite projections. Um, the next one uh, down is gonna be 
a celestial sphere around the Earth pointing in the direction of the telescope where you see the stuff. And then the one on the bottom is at the telescope. Everything in gray is below the horizon. So let's see how I can, yep. All right. So basically this is the clutter that astronomers have to deal with on a nightly basis. They have to try to pierce through that junk just to see things that they care about seeing. And oh, by the way, um, anybody here heard of near-Earth asteroids? Yeah, okay, good. Because the thing is, when we try to look for these things, we have to go through all this junk to try to find these things now. So it, it makes it even harder. And I don't know about you, but you know, when I, when I go to museums in Washington, D.C., and you know, I talk to paleontologists, there's these things called dinosaurs that used to be around here. Um, not so much anymore, especially after one of these things like schwacked the living crap out of the planet. Um, and so they disappeared. And nothing says statistically that that can't happen again. No dinosaurs, but you know, we're here. It'd be really nice to be able to predict when that sort of thing would happen. But we have compromised our ability to be able to do that in many ways. Here's another image of congestion in low Earth orbit. Basically, this is only 24 hours. These are conjunctions only over a 24 hour period. Everything in green is Starlink on Starlink. Blue is Starlink with something else. And red is just you know other objects on each other. This is just 24 hours, just to give you an idea of the crisscrossings that are happening. So what am I trying to tell you? <laughs> well, I see that here in Europe, right, we have this um, ESA has a zero debris policy kind of thing, whatever, whatever, whatever that means. Look, there's this thing called the IADC. It's been around for a long time. And it says, oh, you know, we have to try to prevent probabilities of collision one in a thousand, you know, for any object over its lifetime. There's this 25-year rule. After the thing dies, it has to be removed somehow after 25 years. Could you imagine uh, driving on the road and your car runs out of gas and basically there's a suggestion that you should remove your car 25 years after the thing has been on the side of the, of the road? What could go wrong with that? I gotta tell you, that's like utter stupidity. Right now we have a linear economy in space and linear economy means that the end state of every single object is for it to become junk. That's the, that, that is the end state of everything that we launch is for it to become junk. And we abandon these things once they die. We don't dispose of them. We abandon them. And if it's in a sufficiently low Earth orbit, then Mother Nature, through atmospheric drag, brings these things back into the atmosphere. They burn up in the atmosphere. They pollute the atmosphere. And if they're large, they survive reentry and they end up with the pictures that I showed you before. Now there's this other thing that the ESA zero debris thing says, and it says, oh, you know, for things that re-enter, we want the expected casualty probability to not be more than one in 10,000. Let's see a show of hands. How many people in this room would feel comfortable if the government of whatever country you're living in, even here in Luxembourg, said, you know what? As you're driving, if you go through a tunnel or under uh, some highway, there's only a 1 in 10,000 chance that a piece of that highway will fall on you. Oh, yeah, let me go out driving. I feel so good. That's what we're doing for space. It makes no sense. Zero. And then there's the, oh, the EU net zero thing. We will all come together and hopefully this and hopefully that. There's a lot of hope. That's a bad strategy in and of itself. Here's, here's my challenge to all of you in the room. Establish a circular space economy. Establish a circular space economy that focuses first and foremost on the prevention of pollution through reuse and recyclability. We have reusable rockets. What we don't have, we don't have reusable and recyclable satellites. By the way, that last video of mine, you can cue that right now. We don't have reusable and recyclable rockets. So who could do that, right? I think we could. I think we could make it legal to basically go after anybody 
who is going to have single-use satellites. Just how we try to minimize single-use plastics, we should minimize single-use satellites. The next thing that we should have is proper disposal, which actually means removing stuff, not just abandoning it, not just letting it just sit there for 25 years, but do something with it to dispose of it properly. Here's what I'm trying to tell you guys, right? So that would be part of the circular space economy. I believe that each and every one of us has the power to not control outcomes, but to make wise choices. We have an opportunity to do that. We can implement this sort of circular economy right now and not license people unless they can abide by the reuse recyclability or by proper disposal. I want to challenge everybody in this room to consider yourselves a steward. What does it mean when you look at yourself in the mirror that you are a steward of the planet? I'm not asking you to save the entire earth. I'm just asking you to be present, be mindful. We are becoming more and more disconnected from each other because of technology, when technology could actually help us remember that we're all interconnected somehow and that the problems happening on one side of the planet are our problem as a collective. We can find ways to stop collectively choosing self-extinction. I can't do this by myself, for sure. I have to tell you, I travel a lot. Um, it's very difficult, not just for me, but I also have several children. One of them is a six-year-old. I've missed important dates with her to do these sorts of things. I'm asking for your help. Thank you very much.